That was on our show the other day. Liano. Hey, we yep. are live on Facebook. All right. So we're getting started here. I don't think Deb is going to join us. Jim's coming on right now because she's got work to do in the garden. Uh, however, she's going to start right off with it because it is the biggest, newest news of 2020. Uh, Michael Thompson finally got the commutation from our governor that we have been expecting and wanting for a long time. It just happened today, along with three other prisoners, too. I really don't know the details on them, but four people were commuted today, and Michael Thompson was one of them. So a lot of work, a lot of effort, a lot of time and energy went into a lot of people to make that happen. Uh, of course, he was in prison for a stupid fucking reason for decades. So about fucking time. And of course, you know, we talked about it a little bit, but Richard DeLisi also uh, a couple of weeks ago was finally let out. And, uh, you know, it, it is awesome and it feels great. <laughs> Can you imagine how Michael Thompson fucking feels right now, man? Yeah. Wow. Can't, I mean. Can't imagine. Can't, I can't imagine, man. Fuck. I can only imagine that it's just profound, you know, and uh, so happy for him. Still pissed off that they had a fucking, that anybody has to go through this bullshit, though. Yeah, it, it is. It's a source of frustration that the, the probation and commutation system in Michigan is so onerous. But having said that, we did it. We did it. I mean, there's a lot of people that went into this, as, as Jamie mentioned, but if you look at the timeline, this started to come to prominence. The Cannabis Caucus had an interview with Dana Nessel. We got her interested. She wrote a letter to the governor. The Cannabis Caucus had another interview with Dana Nessel that we recorded where she said she was horrified when she learned the details and thanked us for bringing it to her attention. Uh, we had a, the parole board hearing. Uh, I participated in that. Mm -hmm. uh, Mike McCurdy participated in that, giving testimony, trying to help get him popped out. Um, and then, and then it happens, as, as sometimes dreams do, right? As as only dreams can. Sometimes, from an unexpected corner, at an unexpected time, comes serenity and peace. And I hope that Michael and his family are able to to embrace. A, a full and, and loving life together because they certainly have a lot of time to make up. That's fucking awesome, man. I, I, I do want to encourage the celebration and being happy, especially just think about what's going through this dude's head right now. He was very touched during the parole hearing. Everybody said, look, this guy is fine. He didn't really do anything. He's perfectly able to come out and be productive and not cause any problems. This is, you know, people were very rational and real about it and describing everything. And he was taking it all in. And he was, he, he knew that there was a lot of support and love for him out there at that time. I can only imagine where he is now knowing he's one step closer to, to walking out. Well, and listening to him yeah. describe his, his last few moments as a free man, uh, he drove north on Dort Highway, stopped at a, at a traffic light, a red traffic light on Robert T. Longway. There was a police cruiser already in the intersection. The light turned green. The police lights flashed blue. And that was the last moment he spent as a free man in America. And the the odd part about it is, is that literally half a block away sits a licensed dispensary selling cannabis, selling by the hour more cannabis than that guy got put away for for possessing in, in all of his in all of his actions. So hmm. Our our system our system has advanced so many ways, and we want to want to draw positive attention in places where it's due. But there are some things that we still need to clean up. There are some messes from the previous work, previous life that we lived. That's we still have to come by and and take care of. And if we forget that, if we're so busy racing forward that we stop to look behind, people get lost. People get lost because we failed them. So. This so is you know what? We won. So this you bring up some some good stuff here. Berg's coming on. Um, you know, the the situation with Michael Thompson wasn't a secret. Uh, there were there were many efforts being made to bring this to people's attention and to get meetings with the governor and and all this other kind of stuff. But it really was the the meeting by the reformed uh, Michigan Democratic Cannabis Caucus that include Rick and Mike McCurdy and Zara Boss and Jamie. And Jamie, yeah, that that got word to 
the, the attorney general, which prompted action, which prompted more action. I mean, sometimes these quirky things happen. Everybody knows this problem needs to be fixed, but it's not going to be set in motion unless the right thing happens and the right person does the, does the right thing at the right time. And, and we were definitely a part of that. I mean, we should be very happy that Last Prisoner Project, Redemption, us, it all culminated and many other supporters too. It all culminated. Montel Williams too, hashtag. Yeah. I saw some professional athletes hashtagging free Michael Thompson as well. Uh, clearly when you have that kind of national attention, you're you're actually making some progress. Steven D'Angelo with Last Prisoner Project was very involved as well. So, you know, I wanna talk about uh, year in review today. This is a big, this is a big part of the story of year in review. I mean, uh, the everything we're talking about took place this year as far as a lot of the heavy action moves to be made to, to get him out or to get the at least the commutation. I mean, we'll feel even better about it when he steps out and that's a big press deal and uh, we can see that in action and right. have another celebration as far as I'm concerned. I'm sure maybe we'll get him on this show. I mean, he's, uh, it'd be nice to have the conversation with him uh, from his own his, his, his own heart, you know, how did that, how did that situation you know, feel, how was that experience? I, again, you know, other than it being pretty profound, it's difficult to imagine what that was actually like, what it is actually like for him. And you'd have to be in his situation to really know. I mean, and, and fortunately we're not, but too many people are. It's, hey, Roach is gonna join us. Well, right. good. You know, the, the situation with Michael Thompson was fueled by the drug war, but it was also fueled by a racist society and by a, a judicial system that's supposed to uphold the rights of every American citizen, but very clearly over the decades proved that they didn't really hold the rights of black men as equal as they did white men. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Hey, Roach. Good to see you, man. Um, so year in review. There's a lot of shit that took place this last year, a lot of intense stuff. We started right off by talking about Michael Thompson because he got commuted today, finally. And, and uh, we're super happy. Right that. Hey, but hey, let's, uh, you know, good or bad, one of each, whatever you like. What what about this year was, was the biggest story or, or what were the couple of biggest things that uh, that affected people's lives this year? Obviously, COVID. Uh, and George can't, Floyd. Can't get around that. Black Lives Matter and George Floyd. Right. Uh, man, that's a huge thing. Uh, Brianna anything, Taylor. Let, let, let's spin it around and let, let people say what they think. Uh, Rick, what do you think? Well, it, it's almost going to be very difficult to talk about 2020 uh, without mentioning the pandemic, even though I know it's not specifically cannabis related. Um, but when we talk about all the different things that we accomplished in 2020, and we're going to talk about Black Lives Matter and George Floyd and Michael Thompson and and the election that took place. Um, all of these have to be have to, we have to remember that all those accomplishments took place in the middle of a pandemic, in the middle of a time when everybody was saying stay home, and the American people said no, this is too important. This is something I can't sit on the sidelines for. I have to get involved, even if my involvement is no more than standing on a sign uh, on the side of a street holding a sign in support of some other people that are actually doing actions. Um, America stood up. America showed up at the polls in greater numbers than we ever had before. We've created freedoms for the people of the United States of America that they haven't had, and cannabis law reform charged forward this year. I mean, if you look at the number of states that continue to go for cannabis law reform, whether it's through their legislature or through directly uh, petitioning the government, it's it's shocking. It's a uh, it's amazing. It's beautiful. Um, if you look at the maturation of the hemp program, 2019 was a, an abbreviated hemp carb, carb uh, growth here in Michigan. But this year, Tony Shanika told us that she had 18 foot tall hemp plants, 18 foot tall hemp plants in northern Michigan. That's a success. Um, all of that took place in the middle of the worst pandemic our nation has ever seen. What do you think that is in pounds off of each one of those 18 foot tall plants anybody have well, a with, with hemp though remember that typically uh, when it grows tall like that you're not getting a whole lot of, of uh, mids you're not getting a whole lot of mid bud you're getting mostly top bud mostly cola because the plants are planted so close together that there's not a lot of opportunity for the mids to grow but there's five seven ten pounds or something coming off of those fucking things right i mean there's i mean system. wow 
must be a lot. Okay. There's probably you, a couple. By, different by the way, that, that wasn't, of them. That wasn't like, the uh, that wasn't the uh, impetus of your of your of your story there, Rick. And I apologize to, to take that off track. It just okay. caught me as a as a curious thing, imagining an eighteen foot tall hemp plant. And, well, you know, and, so and, and, and when we grow hemp for long chain fibers, we won't be worried about the flowers. But this hemp was grown for CBD flower, so flower is very relevant to its production. Jim Salame, you've been around for a while. You've seen a lot. You uh you had successes with decriminalized nature Ann Arbor this year. 2020 has been just wild. What are your takeaways from this year, sir? Uh, well, first of all, happy uh, belated winter solstice, everybody. Um, I don't know if anyone saw the junction of Jupiter and Saturn. Too um, cloudy. Too cloudy. Good. But, uh, you know, this year has been crazy. Obviously, like the big wins, like decrim nature um, and getting all the support for that and just that still continuing to grow. Um, that's probably one of the biggest ones for me. Uh, and then, you know, obviously the pandemic and the election and all that, that stuff, um, uh, you know, plays a big, big role in it. Um, Michael Thompson today, uh, that's obviously huge. What a great way to end the year, um, on a great note like that. And, and hopefully that, uh, keeps the momentum And Michael after he gets with his family and has time to acclimate can then come out and help us uh, do that, uh, for other people. Um, so that's, it's just awesome where that's going. Um, I'm trying to think of other really cool things, you know, um, I don't know. I think like COVID really brought people into uh, themselves to kind of take inventory on things and, um, and, and kind of, you know, uh, reassess. So there's some positive things there, uh, hopefully for people. I'll tell you what I've, I've noticed in 2020, and I'm going to go to Colin next, so get ready for your comments. But there are some people in my life that I, I assumed were really good friends. But now that you're not able to interact with them like we used to before, some of that have drifted. And I, I find that my life really isn't any lesser because they're not around me every single day. Like those people, enjoy their company, and would choose to, to spend time with them if I could. But I think I have a better idea, a better definition of what my relationships are now. Mm -hmm. I think COVID forced that upon us. Yeah, that's just my observation. But Colin, what about you? Um, well, you know, 2020 has been quite the year. Uh, we forgot that in the beginning, Donald Trump was impeached um, before COVID. And then, um, well, yeah, like... A bunch of shit happened just in January. Just to yeah. Throw in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, also, uh, like I just was like part of like the whole decriminalized nature and watching that growth throughout like all of like even last year like this time like we were like starting and meeting like regularly and like that grew into something and uh, that was really cool um, but you know COVID you know shut us down and we learned about Zoom um, I'm sure most of you didn't know about it. But I, I learned about it two years ago or three years ago because I had to uh, use it for a job. And so I already had it downloaded on my phone. I was like, oh. Man, you're like super hipster with that. I am pretty hipster. Uh, um, didn't, I didn't actually, you, I'm, hey, Colin, didn't you, didn't you stop a robbery in 2022? That was, I didn't stop a robbery in 2020. I, that was uh, 2019. Oh, um, I thought that was this so I, And I didn't really stop it. I just was there, okay? <laughs> you know, what happened with the bong? You know what happened? Just reprimanded the, the <laughs> thief. You get back out of it. Yesterday, yeah, there's a new place. twist of the story. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, uh, well, well uh, also, like, the MORE Act was kind of significant in a way. Mm -hmm. um, and we uh, got, like, 1200 bucks once, and we're supposed to get 600 bucks coming again to add us. So that was kind of weird, too. Um, yeah. Even people that are still working are getting paid, and, you know, whatever. So, Berg... Yeah, and, like, I like There's lost a job. Too. Like I, I, I quit my uh, job as a bud tender this year too. So it's kind of significant, and I think in a way. It is. Berg, what what do you have to add about twenty twenty observations? Uh, I mean, I'm I'm just glad 
Well, it's it's still not over. They they're taking it too far as far as the elections go, but I mean I think my the most I like about twenty twenty is uh next year that motherfucker's out of office, man. It's not even who's replacing him. It's just the fact that get that motherfucker out of there, you know. Talk about an accomplishment. Yeah, you know what we always talk about too, though. Unfortunately, while we say get him out, all the things that brought him there and the set of circumstances that have empowered him uh, exist. He still got seventy plus million people. Yeah. No, oh, I mean they they took a they took a survey of Trump supporters, and over <laughs> half, over half of them still think that this motherfucker is not leaving the fucking White House. Like, 300,000 300, people signed up to to a virtual second inauguration for President Trump. Was that a scam I heard? <laughs> it could be. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised. Those people fall for everything, right? They, I get I get all these emails, uh, you know, begging me for money from Trump because uh, somebody on the Michigan Normal List signed us up for something one time. Um, Jesus Christ. Right. Yep. So Roach, you're the you were the next one to join our broadcast. We'll get to Mr. Hashbash in just a moment. But Roach, thank you for joining us. <laughs> Enjoyed your time on Medical Mondays last night. What are your observations about 2020? Well, you know, I feel like I've been in quarantine since 2019. Um everything that's been going on, it just it just seems all, all so coincidental and calculated. But in that, like you said, uh, it's kind of forced people to decide about their relationships with each other, with themselves, with the people that they live with. Um, because there, there's no escaping this reality, you know. Um, as far as the political things go with the election um you know i i, I kind of see things through maybe a different perspective just because like you said it's making people reevaluate themselves and their relationships and to me this this kind of stuff is, is is like old hat and like historically speaking this kind of stuff is old hat to melanated people in America. But the fact that now it's being cast upon the entire country, um, I, I, I'm really interested to see how it all turns out. There might, um, you say there might be some real change? I mean, there, Black Lives Matter well, might be a force that does something? Well, we'll see, Black Lives Matter is, is two different things. You know, I, I think when you say Black Lives Matter, there's like a movement and then there's an organization. Correct. You know, and it's two two different things going on there. And like okay. I said, this is nothing, this isn't surprising to me at all. This is standard par for the course stuff. You know, I'm, I'm waiting for the rest of America to catch up to what's going on. So in a sense, I think it's good. Um, you know, if people watch Medical Mondays or have heard me on here, you know, I, I guess I have some pretty liberal views, you know, and, and, and all of that. But in reality, I'm kind of rooting for Trump to stay president. And I'm glad that he's like doubling down and hunkering because it's forcing people to make a choice. Are you with this crazy shit or not? And well, it, yeah, I, I, it did that before. That's why we got so much more participation in politics than we've ever seen. I mean, we talk about the 70 plus million for Trump, but uh, Joe Biden got what, 70, what, 77? 81. Million or 81, 81 million. Okay. So, I mean, both of those independently are the, are the most that any president's gotten in, in an election. Uh, you know, Biden comes out on top because yeah, no, no, most like of this, this one. Whole, this whole Trump whether, is like the least diplomatic thing. Ever. Whether whether a group or a, or a movement, I mean, how which whichever side that we're taking on, it's a thing that happened in response, and it was a lot more substantive in response than what we've seen. It's not like yes, everybody's pissed off. Here's some lip service, blah blah blah. Okay, now I'll just 
everything goes back to normal and another incident becomes, you know, front and center again that we all respond to. It's just a series of lip service. It just seems like there's some change coming out of this, whether it's significant enough and all that kind of stuff. I mean, I don't know. The can, we, can, we not give Trump so much, can we not give Trump so much credit on the 70 some million votes that he got? Because a lot of those are people that voted for him purely on the Republican ticket, not for anything to do with him himself. No, but he is so. responsible for the large amount of votes that the Democrats right. got. One of the he things that out, he did he brought was out get more people, people to, to the polls right. than he brought out more people to the polls than anybody else. I would include Bernie Sanders in that. Well, let me just say that, that we made voting easier for America this time around. So let's not, in my personal opinion, I don't think we should be assigning credit to any individual personality for the fact that we had a record level vote. I think we should be assigning the fact that we made it so much easier for most of Americans to vote. Well, a combination so, thereof, because even in 2018, there was a sign of, of, a, of a new world of participation taking place. And it was probably in response to the craziness of the presidential election. Yep. A lot of people that never, ever believed in the elections process actually found themselves standing in line for hours to vote because I felt so strongly about it. Adam, it's your turn. Talk to us about 2020's observations uh, and your expectations, maybe for next year. It's uh, to me, um, that's why I did my dab here before I went. I knew I'd miss 420 <laughs> once again. Um, to me, 2020 has been the woke year of misinformation. So there are many people that have become what we call woke. <laughs> However, if you just became woke, dumbass, you woke. you've been asleep. Um, you know, we can talk about all these people that you guys can probably remember their names because they've been in the paper recently. But I remember Warren in 23rd in Malice Green. Mm -hmm. That happened in my city. Buds and endeavors. Ain't so shit fast. happened in my city since. Yeah, I See? got I got roughed up by buds and endeavors in my lifetime. Really? Well, oh yeah. That's what you get for being black. You know what, Roger? Give, give that little story, man, if you don't mind. Give us a Tell little it. headline on what happened there. Okay, so look, man. Uh, <laughs> my, my first job, it wasn't like I applied or I aspired. You know, I was just in there playing video games so much that the corner store offered me a job. So it was like my first job. And it was a popular store right by the bridge, right by the third precinct. All the cops would come in there and play their lottery, come behind the counter, get liquor. It was, you know, it was like little cop land back there, you know, behind the glass. You know, and the owners were real receptive to them and wanted that uh police attention and all of that so it was cool <clears throat> i would see these dudes literally every day and there's like other and here's like the thing there's other cops that were a part of this little circle that nobody talks about either that were like worse because they had a longer career okay would see these guys on a daily fucking basis would not stop them from <coughs> putting me in jail when I was not within the walls of that fucking establishment. Fuck me up, do all kind of shit. And then that's day at work. How you doing, little guy? Yeah. <laughs> that's the power game. But that's a that's a Big city Look, police I'm, I'm game. 14, I'm 14 years old. Okay. I got good grades. I go to parochial school and I have a job. And they're fucking with me. They but again, that was that, their job. Right. <laughs> again, that was that was part of the job in the city at the time. That that was something that Detroit was well known for for generations, you know, prior to Budson and Nevers. They used to have the big four, you know. Um, mm -hmm. I actually am good friends with uh, uh, Cindy Ann Hinkle in uh, uh, Bay City. Her father was one of the members of the big four. I mean, the stories that, that are told, that, the way they used to harass people. And what I like to tell people is, you know, Detroit was unique. That it had this all-white police force in a city that was getting darker. And then Coleman Young became mayor and he said, you know what, I'm going to darken up the police force and make it look like the city. And in order to do that, he lowered, which this doesn't affect police work. Don't get me wrong. I'm not making any comment. 
He lowered the standard. So all you needed was a high school education. You didn't need a college degree. Well, that enabled a bunch of young black men to sign up to be Detroit police officers. The problem with that is that those young black men then go and be tra are trained by white cops to become cops. And those same young black cops were then turned into no different than those white cops. These same racist guys who saw their, these young black kids as being a problem. So it's been a long time for us to get away from that in the city of Detroit. And I like to point out that, you know, Budson and Nevers, they weren't the last. Mm. But oh, those no. days, those and days, like, those days are coming to a close in the city because they've gone more to a community type police. I, I, I just want to add, know. like growing up in Southwest too. Southwest was like Southwest was like a totally different place. It's, in its own island, right? It was like you know, it was in in Southwest. It didn't matter if you were white. You could ask nope. Roach. Like I was harassed more than this motherfucker was. You know, like well, straight up. Like they didn't give a fuck what color you were. They were like, "Where's the drugs?" How, oh, they found some roaches on my friend and said, oh, how are we supposed to get high off of this? And made us do fucking push-ups in the fucking snow, you know? like Assholes, man. So, you know, Bunsen and Nevers separated the uh, male screen skelp. I mean, yep. They lifted the skelp off the... I mean, that's, that's, that's fucking... With a, with a uh, so, flashlight. Right. So yeah, uh, magnum. The magnum. What if, yeah. One of the things I like to point out and what we were talking about 2020 had malice green happened in the information era had malice green happened in the era where I could go live on my phone from a street corner where I could call people out and say, Hey, come on. We're about to protest. Had malice green happened, then things would be very different, yeah. but because they happened the way they happened, it's been a much slower progression here. Now, I would point out during all these protests that we saw in 2020, they all across the country, they also happened here. They happened in the suburbs in a few spots, but they regularly happened nightly mm -hmm. in Detroit. And the only confrontations that happened were between protesters and police officers. And at yep. this point, there are investigations into the actions of those police officers who fired upon um, journalists, um, <clears throat> groups of journalists, multiple times. I mean, this isn't just a one-off. You know, yeah. they, didn't they didn't catch the family once, and they didn't catch the reporter once, and they didn't catch the hoodlums once. They caught yeah. the reporters three times and fired rubber bullets and mace at them. And... Yeah. These things are coming to light and they're making change. I just like to point out that for what everybody has to say about Detroit, Detroit was at the head of the curve for this action. And I believe it's because of what we've gone through in the past, which goes to what's happening in 2020. The fact that people have access to information, the fact that people are home and not working and, and have time on their hands and can get on the internet and do all kinds of things. Um, things have changed, you know, uh, Colin talked about using Zoom a couple years ago because uh, he had a job thing. I was using Zoom in 2012 and couldn't get anybody to participate. Because, Google Hangouts. Yeah. And what yeah, happened to right. Skype? Well, I was going to yeah. say, because at the time I was competing with something called Google Hangouts yeah. and that never went anywhere. But Zoom took off in the business world. And that's how I originally had heard about it. Now you got grandmother Zooming. Now, I mean, John Sinclair, for God's sakes, can get on a Zoom call, okay? It took a little work in the beginning. It, it, you got to walk him through things. But once you show him the process, he gets it. And there's tons of people out there now. You know, we did that. Uh, we did the, the, the uh, virtual hash bash. We did the 420 virtual thingy. We've done a, I don't, I mean, we've all been involved in a half a dozen virtual things where there's more people on the screen than you could possibly shake a stick at. Yeah. And, We're all not and, meeting in a studio to do this show. We're all in <laughs> places around the state right now doing this show. And, and I happen to be reading Zoom. a book, which I'll pimp out right now called Post-Corona from Crisis to Opportunity. 
And it talks of exactly about what we're talking about. The fact that all kinds of things now are normal on Zoom. <coughs> this is going to take us into the new era because at one point you would have never used a Zoom call on television. You would have never used it as a remote live at, uh, on television. Now it's a daily occurrence yeah. to the point that in business, if you've seen what's happened in the business world over the last year, it used to look like this in the background. Now the business calls and the people from their homes have now moved into corners where they have perfectly decorated backgrounds. It's very subtle. The colors have, oh, but Jamie, I'm going to tell you, they've even gone past that. They've gotten to the point where they have somebody tell them how to, you know, feng shui their fucking corner oh, yeah. so that it looks more like an appropriate business call and all of that crap. And, and your background, you're absolutely right. Those yeah. are designers set up in some cases. And, yes. So that that guy from Michigan Bro Grow show, uh, Bildo or whatever his name is, uh, is a very cool dude. Yeah, he's got a total nice, beautiful. Um, well, I didn't say dildo. I said like Bildo or something like that. <laughs> but skill. You, know, sk you did mode. say dildo, but it was after you said Philbo the first time. Okay. Yeah. okay. But, I just want to get that out there. You did say. Point being. Uh, whether or not you all have dildos on your minds or not, point being, the guy's got a nice little uh, setup. It's a good example and, of what I'm talking about. Right. And, and, and I poke fun at it. I mean, my setup has two butt plugs in the background. Um, they're constantly in the shot. Most people have no idea. Um, and where's the third one at any given time? It's, it, he doesn't want to discuss that. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> I'm gonna get a I'm gonna get a demonstration. Huh? Okay. <laughs> Why his earlier show he wears no pants? Because he yeah. Hey. But I do think that the information era that we thought we had entered into before took off um, on a rocket ship in 2020, and uh, the reality is that you know you can hate on Donald Trump all you want. We now are able to use more characters on Twitter because of Donald Trump. Okay. That was directly related to him. More people voted because of Donald Trump. I don't know who else in this country has done more to energize politics. So too bad it had to be that way, but I think you're, I think you're right. I think well, we all, but, I mean, but, it but also, I, with Trump what, being president, with Trump being president, it's brought out all these motherfuckers that have been underneath the woodwork too. Well, wait a minute. Know? Let me and let me back a up. A lot, a lot of these racist motherfuckers have True. came out with, with full I agree. force. Oh. Well, wait, but hold on. Let me back up because what happened was, as he's bringing these people out, you have to understand that we have this social thing going on. Where at the same time in this culture, we're shaming people to put their rebel flags away. Now, I'm not saying everybody that flew a rebel flag was a racist. But I had a pretty good idea what their politics were. And now we've shamed them into hiding that stuff. So now they all had to come out. And as, as Rick Thompson said, we're all fascinated at the relationships that we had and how we watched them crumble on social media. Um, did, you see, did you see the story where the Proud Boy, they were all fucking, you know, got combat gear on, walking to the hotel and shit. And then they're like, they tell that. They they announce it on social media. Oh yeah, come to such and such hotel. We'll, we're gonna be there. That's fucked up. Man. There's later video of him like in this in the hospital. Somebody went and fucking stabbed him and fucking shanked him. We were just teased. We 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 were, we were given the presentation of Tom Beller from Real Leaf Solutions, and then when I went to go talk to him, he switched seats real quick with Ryan Basor. Oh was, man. Must be up in Kalkaska at the Real Leaf Solutions. I am. Wow. It is. It's uh, beautiful up here. And I want to smoke. Didn't want to totally get to hey, Some of their weed is awesome, by the way. Kalkushka, lots of it, man. Switch. So, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> didn't mean to cut you off, Berg, but, but definitely wanted to ask uh, Ryan to come on, especially in, in light of the uh, commutation today and the Redemption Foundation was, was a big part of those discussions and has spearheaded the group uh, that has raised a lot of money to help people out in Michael Thompson's situation, uh, you know, when and if they are to be released. So I just want to get your reaction, Ryan. Plus we're talking about year in review 2020. This was a big story and it ends on a yeah. good note. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm super excited because I didn't, uh, 
I'll be quite honest with you. I didn't know what to expect, expect from, uh, from our governor, if she was going to do, do anything or not, I'll be honest. And, uh, she actually did it. And, uh, you know, uh, three other gentlemen were, were also, uh, in the same boat and hopefully a lot more Rudy Gamo, but that's just exciting. I, we needed a win. We needed to get some momentum going. I mean, we put a lot of energy into this as, as you guys know, and, um, been a lot of work maybe that's just kind of more of a, the the dam or, or just the start of the pushing that boulder up the hill it's moving a little bit now and um I, what we need is this to see both sides of the, the of the aisle and everyone say oh of course you should release him and get good press and everyone you know both whether you're left or right or, or neither in between should think this is a good idea and you know we always got to prove to these politicians that it's a political winner first um, before like uh, anything else. So it's exciting. I would like to say that I did get my post up one minute before Rick Thompson. <laughs> Your Facebook post? <laughs> I was, I was pushing. Yeah. I was pushing hard, uh, pushing hard on my PR team to make sure that like, we got to beat Rick. So <laughs> one minute. Well, well that's, a standard. That's, a, that's a standard. If you beat Rick, it's a bunch of Don't even, don't sorry. even try to do that. <laughs> so, that was pretty speedy. Uh, well, you know, we, we so, talked about. Go ahead, Jamie. I was gonna. I was gonna ask Ryan if you want to continue this. That's fine, Rick. But I was gonna say, obviously, Redemption came into the world. The Redemption Foundation came into the world. Both have done great things in a short period of time. And um, when you talk about 20, 2020 review, Redemption has a lot. To yeah, do. exactly. And I was gonna say there. We, yeah, we got that. And I, twenty twenty in the midst of a bunch of weird shit's been a good year for you, Ryan. And uh, it's. Personally and professionally, definitely yeah. the best year of my life. Not even right. close. Um, and I've uh, had a lot of shitty years, so I'm, I don't feel bad about saying that. I um, hope <laughs> everyone had a great year or can make the best out of a situation, as Adam knows, and I'm sure there's some others on here. Like when you're when you're put in a shitty situation, it's like it, it kind of reminded me like it's time for me to go to work, you know, like make myself better. And it's not like being locked up, nothing like it. But, you know, it's it's time to work on yourself and time to – improve when you, uh that's how you keep the brain going positively if you're getting better and um and all that so that's kind of the way i approached it i've been been working out four to five times a week for over half a year and uh i've been eating like a pig so it hasn't really worked that well but i'm i'm gonna try to change that on the new year but just just feeling good and um you know i got i got stumbled a little bit with my launch i tried i was ordering packaging from a factory in Wuhan right before the Chinese New Year and the pandemic. So let's just say it slowed me down about five months. I'm excited to say that all my packaging now is coming from the United States. I've been switched over and I'm really pumped about that. And, uh, you know, the technology. And I think there's a lot of companies, as I'm finding out, as I'm learning more about the packaging industry, which is I understand why there's a major in it now at Michigan State and all these colleges. <laughs> um, you know, it's there's, there's more people looking to do that because who knows what the future brings with tariffs, wars, pandemics. Um, it's a lot easier to drive to Wisconsin than talk to someone in Shanghai or something, you know, and demand a, a refund. So that's gone real well. Um, real excited to get the foundation up. Um, it's really, you know, I have a good team around me. I have a, a business coach, an accountant, and a, a PR and a marketing team. Um, but it's besides that, it's just me and, uh, you know, my relationships with my growers and processors. So I'm not able to do as much as I'd like, um, but I'm working on that <laughs> and with the foundation, especially to really get things going in the, in the, in the second quarter of, uh, of next year to where I can spend a lot more time. So um, we, we did work, we, we teamed up the last prisoner project and Michigan Cannabis Caucus, the Democratic Party, um, you know, uh, and then, you know, Weed Maps and Montel helped some, but it was really our group of three and uh, we raised a lot of money to get this going and we're putting money on people's books and helping. And we're also, you know, now when Michael gets out, he's got plenty of money to, to get established and get going. And uh, yeah. so this was the first. So I, it's definitely, you definitely celebrate along the way. It's all the process. Yeah. And um, I, I take a break and I'm going to be celebrating this one tonight when I get home. Some inter intertwined stories there. And it's all cool. All in 2020, there's kind of a return of activism to a degree. We've talked it about is. that on the show before. And then that turned out to have some positive results within the same year. And, and to set the pace for some, hopefully, some more good stuff uh, next year along these lines. Yeah, it's really cool. Um, I, I didn't know what to expect with the Last Prisoner Project, but uh, Sarah and uh, Michelle, who, who are really running the day-to-day, -day, they are super talented ladies that are 
in it for all the right reasons. Um, and, and they're dedicated and they're organized. So they, they really helped with the overall structure and getting things, but we're like, we're boots on the ground in Michigan and they're, they're making Michigan their test, their number one state because we got such an activism community. We've had our doors kicked in for so much. There's so many people that are, that are upset about it. And you know, they created this, this, this mess. They created this whole situation on themselves. Um, and then, you know, that, that's why when the cops say uh, they're mad that, you know, they got Gretchen elected, they ran Bill Schuette and, you know, same thing with Dana. Like they did that by, by, by creating all of us and what we went through and how long we fought. But like Michigan is the test case. We got the most um, activists. We got the most favorable uh, AG that they're working with, the legislature and uh, people are engaged and we have a lot of people that have been adversely affected by having the door kicked in or, or, or getting charges, you know? Um, so it's just, uh, they're going to take Michigan and make it their, their state and then try to duplicate it in the rest. So I'm glad to get the, glad we're getting the attention. I'm glad we had the success and, you know, I'm glad, uh, so many people in Michigan here. Hey, what, hey, Rick, go ahead this time, man. I was going to okay. jump in again, but go ahead. Sarah Gersten from the uh, Last Prisoner Project, who you're talking about, she spoke uh, at Michael Thompson's parole board hearing. Uh, I also spoke at that too. There's about 13 of us that gave testimony. Uh, she was very, very professional, very uh, eloquent. Uh, and some of the things that she talked about, uh, the general reasons why we want to embrace uh, commutation and expungement and why people should generally be released from parole and the dangers of remaining incarcerated. Uh, good asset to have uh, you know i'm glad that they're treating michigan as a test case because that means we got our favorite son michael thompson out of jail but i imagine ohio needs that same kind of attention yeah. illinois needs that same kind of attention and then again <laughs> you know we, we focus a lot about states with big urban populations but some of the worst bastards the rural exist, states. some of these these rural states man these wyoming guys well look rick guys. look at oklahoma which has got yep. a, a lot more open than us now three years ago they were the number one per square mile spot in the world basically for marijuana arrests and now it's just the wild west down there which is awesome but you know that that needs like that's crazy down there that they're not done like, it's coming down there too uh, obviously but you're exactly right it needs but to the, happen the important thing is michigan is a success story so that when they start to duplicate what we did here in other states they have a positive example that they can build from and we were part of that and i'm sure that that's an ongoing relationship uh, we talk about the Redemption Foundation, but they're also the Michigan Cannabis Prisoner Release Project has started as well, too, Ryan. Can you talk about that? <laughs> yeah, so it's uh, Michigan Cannabis Prisoner Relief Fund, and we created it uh, through Last Prisoner Project. But my uh, myself, uh, the Michigan Cannabis Caucus, and um, you know them, they, they all we all talk on how that money gets allocated. They've totally are cool. Like we're, we're we decide it for Michigan, and we raised almost now forty five grand. It was initially thirty up to 45 we're getting more trickling in and i think this will be a big help but you know like it's whether it's putting you know giving helping out rudy gamo's family who's you know they're having trouble with uh, his son's leukemia bills uh right now and in her and, and putting money on people's books putting 10 grand aside to show that when michael thompson gets out he has an apartment he has support because, uh, you know, they use that against you. Oh, you don't have a family. Oh, you don't have a place to stay. Oh, you don't have this. Well, why don't you? Well, and then, so like they were, even though we were telling them that, that, that we had this money for them, this funds, they were still, the parole board, that department was acting like he had no support. So like that was one of the reasons we did it so publicly is like now you can't deny that Michael Thompson has money when he gets out because it's all over the media and you've been you've been told that at the hearing so that was that was part of the strategy there because they were using that as a reason is not even talk like bringing it to bringing it to the committee so um it's awesome um we're gonna hopefully ra raise a lot more money and I, I want to you know we'll be real transparent where it goes um so more people can get excited about it and uh you know i think we're, we're still like that list that we got from the ag's office we're like at a thousand thousand people and there's still other people in jail that aren't on that list that have their 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 um, sentences enhanced because of marijuana, like a coke charge. Maybe you get it's seven years, fine. You know, uh, you did it, fine. But you, you had three grams when you're 19 years old, and now you got 15 years. Like it's bullshit. Like that stuff's got to be addressed because that's like as you really start peeling the layers. Um, you know, which I thought I knew a lot of the layers. I'm learning new layers of how fucked up 
weed plays as far as like keeping people like our justice and our criminal system. It's crazy every step of the way. Let me just jump in real quick for our viewers that don't know the list Ryan just mentioned is a list provided by the Attorney General's Office to the Cannabis Caucus and Redemption Foundation and Last Prisoner Project, which lists out all of the prisoners in Michigan jails uh, controlled by the state that had cannabis as a as a uh, compounding issue in their sentence or where they were directly sentenced as a result of it. That's a list we're working off of to decide who we can help pop out of jail. Go ahead, Ryan. So, or, or or a couple, yeah, a couple of things um, from the from our our viewers right now, uh, Danielle, who's a good friend of the show, um, just said that this is this is a year of silver linings. Like uh, everybody realizes we have a bunch of shit going on. We're always looking out for <laughs> the positives we can take out of it. I thought that was a pretty good message. Thanks. Dylan mentions uh, a lot of the uh, infighting between families and good friends over politics this last year is a, is a big dynamic. That's very true too. I've experienced some of that. Well, it seems like for the first time, people actually have been offended by what their family members thought and said. I mean, we all knew we all knew people in the past who had different political views. Yeah. Um, that was never a problem. Now, seem people seem to be taking offense, and I can only assume it's because in this last choice, you were either on the you were just on the side of normal, or you were on the side of crazy. And if you were on the side of crazy, people just couldn't handle that. Right. We've, we've I mean, decided to speak up now more than we ever had before. Jamie, what else do we have in the chat there? Well, I just want to mention one more thing, too. Uh, going back to even some of the stuff that Adam was talking about before with all of these voters, I think that we, even though it's a, it's a weird phenomenon that we're talking oh. about, but don't we feel better when way more people are participating in the yeah. process, even if we don't like the final answer, you know, then right. just a well, few people showed up that day and made a decision and that's for something else. Politicians, But that's something politicians have never wanted, both oh, Democrats right. and Republicans, yep. is they do not want participation. They, they don't. do not I mean, want everybody Remember the old saying, the old saying was, uh, you don't talk about religion and you don't talk about politics with people right. because of what can, where that conversation, where that conversation will go. But nowadays, I mean, it's important that we talk about that stuff. That's how we progress. That's well, how we grow. That's how we well, learn about each other's point of view. And well, uh, I think that's just now starting to, to, to show itself and surface even more. So We've also entered this digital era in such a way that a guy who had no chance of ever running for politics ever in his life and therefore didn't was able to spend 10 years on television on one of the highest rated shows of all time and then spend what equated to very little money to become the highest office in the land. Mm -hmm. um, and now I think that since we've seen that, there will be a backlash to it that will never happen again. Um, mm -hmm. There will be celebrity politicians but there will never be any first time in politics president. There will never be any politicians who used to be, I mean, celebrities. There may be the Arnold Schwarzenegger types who become That's governor. Even sure, I hope. Right. I mean, there are guys who will work their way up. Don't get me wrong. The Sonny Bonos of the world. Uh, Ronald Reagan was a great example. we really worked his way up. Um, Jesse Ventura, man, the old wrestler, he was governor, didn't yeah. right. he? Right. He talked about, and he talked about and running once, for president. Once, yeah, I, yeah what I did. liked about him was once he got into government and seen what it was all about, he was like, "Fuck this shit." Yeah, he, he moved, moved to, to Mexico, Mexico man. <laughs> right. He, right? He exposed what he could and left. Yeah, but I mean, like, that's you know. This shit. So, Ryan, uh, uh, um, any other? particular 2020 scenario to highlight or important to you um you know i i for me that's real important and something i think about and talk about and maybe i'm right maybe i'm wrong but i even watching what's just happened in the market uh i'm just really excited about michigan marijuana michigan marijuana scene because um th there's a lot of these big companies that opened up in michigan and started in michigan and valued themselves in 17 before the bubble burst in 18 and um you know like doesn't know anything about marijuana i got told how everything was gonna go and like looked at us as a bunch of dumb stoners and we're winners at everything else we do we're gonna these guys don't know what but they don't understand <laughs> like this is like a for some for a lot of us this is like a lifestyle like it's all i think 24 7 it's all we thought about it's all we like we believe in it willing to do and about anything for it and 
the little guys right now that are agile, they're adjusting. They built relationships, uh, you know, which is who, who knew you needed to build relationships and, and give customer service and be, and be a good person. Um, they're selling their products still. And there's been a market crash where even some of these, these big guys, they can't sell it at all in, because there's enough growers out there now. I mean, what happened, in, and we're going to talk about tomorrow on my show um, at one o'clock is like, i never, the market just, I mean, people went from four grand to two grand and now they can't sell it. because everyone's like, go fuck Those me. are per pound prices you're referring to. And, right. and, yeah. and, and the brands and people that are working hard and that have a little following there, you know, they're going to get their two to three grand a pound. And that's going to stay that way for a while. But like th those guys who wants, who wants to, you know, people had the, people got treated really, really rudely. A lot of these stores, but a lot of the, the mom and pop stores buy these big rows when they're the only ones that had anything you had to buy and they were they were assholes about it and uh now who's now, who, now they're not even they're not even having to buy from them it's so we're hearing you know, like now they want to come and um cap the grows at the state level go back after the black market you know and the only way that we the only way the, you attack the black market is by <laughs> providing great products at a low price and that's the only way and they still well, you know, but, but you know, you shouldn't even worry about it though. The pie is no, big. Just be good. And these are big time, you know, like they're, I'm sure they're part, they're, you know, that's what drives me nuts. They're like capitalism, capitalism. I love capitalism, but like it's bullshit because There's capitalism a, is letting the best man to best win. When, and if you aren't good at it, they're, they're trying to get, you know, the crony capitalism, the politicians, the artificial to market control, the use, use their influence on the lawmakers yeah, and yeah, policy making. There's, plen there's plenty for everybody. Exactly. Sure. And the reality is this. And, and I'm, I consider myself a self-appointed spokesman for the black market. Yep. Yes, Reality you do, Adam. Yep. You, can, you can fucking bring it all you want, all right? <laughs> We've perfected this over the last, what, 80, 90, 100 years? Exactly. We had the war declared against us. And on the I, I, honestly, drugs won the war on drugs. Yeah. We're doing yeah. okay. Yeah. Bring it. Congratulations Bring to drugs it. for winning the war on drugs. <laughs> the reality is this. I'm happy that we've got guys like Director Brisbo who are willing to sit down and talk with us. Because for a long time, the only time we could get a politician or any type of uh, 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 person that could make a difference to listen to us. A real decision maker, right? A decision maker, right. Was if we committed a crime and ended up in the front page of the newspaper. Or if we I'm, dangled a sick child in front of their face and forced well, yeah. them to pay that attention always, to it. I mean, or, or dangled a, a Christmas Listen. ornament with, with actual buds in it. Yeah, there you that. go. I can tell you back in the <laughs> 90s when uh, um, Smith, uh, uh, Mike uh, Rogers was a, a local a representative, he went to Livingston High School and he at, was talking to the kids at Livingston High School and they told him how excited they were because Hash Bash was coming up. And he went to the newspaper and he got some press on it. And I went to the newspaper and I said, fuck this douchebag. Of course, these kids are all excited about hash bash because their parents don't give a shit what they're doing on a Saturday afternoon. It's noon on a Saturday. What's a high school kid doing there? That's not on us. That's on the parents. And Rogers and I got in a thing over the years. We never had politicians talk about us. Now we have elected officials reaching out to us to ask if they can appear at our events. Yeah. I mean, yeah. this is this Dana is huge. We, we've got we've got people's us. we've got people's personal cell phones. Yeah, yep. Yeah. I remember. Uh, I won't ask. I won't ask who's got what. Yeah. But I know people that have cell phones numbers, personal cell phone numbers, that. It's like a get out of jail call if you needed it. Well, I'm, I'm not sure I'd ever want to pull on that thread because yeah. the, the backlash would just be horrible. I know so and so. You got to let but, me off. No, but, but no, but no, they no got, that's not. No, that's not the issue. Never, the point is, yeah. these people are connected. They yep. know each other, and that's what makes things happen. Yep. Okay. And and, and what at, what you're saying, Adam, is what's so much different than these other states. And we're, and we're right. telling these guys, you should have gone to one of those other states. Sorry, you're from Michigan, but. You right. got to be, you suck. You need to go to Ohio, Illinois, or New York, New Jersey, or Florida, buy a license and where you're guaranteed to, to have it because that you know, normal those states, they'll go and spend a million on the top five lobbyists and they get whatever they want whatever done. They want. Right. 
can't do that here. We we were we got into politics when I started getting and then met you, Adam, two thousand and nine. Like we started getting like Jeff Irwin would talk to us. And then, you know, you end up helping with campaigns. You end up raising money. You end up doing initiatives. Now, like we're friends, like you're saying, we're friends with these these <clears throat> politicians and these reps and the attorney so, general and different people. So you yeah. can't just buy your way in Michigan, you know? No, and, and what we need to do is we need to put our people in office. Now, I happen to know, I knew Jeff Irwin long before he ran for office, okay? Um, we were old poker buddies in Ann Arbor, him and a crew of mine. But we, we, um, we need to put us, our people, get them elected so that we don't have to ply them with um, uh, money and we don't have to send our, uh, uh, who do them people you guys hire to get all the work done? Lobbyists. Lobbyists, yes, sorry. It's a word I try not to use, so it's not a <laughs> legal bribers. But the so the point is, the point is, we don't we don't hire politicians. That. What what we want is we want to know that if we have a question, and I'm a one issue guy, I'm a weed guy. If I got a weed thing, I know I can call Jeff Irwin, and he's gonna see it my way. He may not agree with me, but he'll understand where I'm coming from. He knows what I mean by what I'm saying. And we can work together. Not like these other people who, geez, I can't tell you how many hundreds of phone calls I've made into congressmen's offices where if I was able to finally get through to some legislative assistant and they'd let me run my mouth for five minutes, if I were to ask them what I just talked about, they wouldn't have known. Yeah. And we all made those calls for years and that's how we would lobby. But now it's a whole different world. We're and it's not, it's partially because of these big guys with the money. It's partially because of their influence. But in Michigan, we're lucky because our legis our, our political people see it from our point of view also. We've well, taken them on the tours and we've educated them properly as opposed we, to the misinformation. So sorry. before we jump to before we jump to uh, uh Jamie's special guest, let me just say uh, I want to remind everybody Michigan is traditionally rated year after year after year is having the most corrupt legislature with the worst processes on a national basis. It's recognized the influence peddling that goes on in our legislature is greater than it goes on in other states. So you would imagine, <laughs> Brian mentioned these people that would have had success in a closed market where there's a fixed number of licenses, where once they got in, they were guaranteed, no matter how badly they screwed up, they would still keep their license. They came to Michigan, and no matter how corrupt the legislature is, you can't buy your way out of a bad business plan. And the black market has always existed. Uh, I had a director Briswell on my show on December 9th, and I asked him specifically about how many people in Michigan actually consume pot. He said, we don't have any actual numbers, but our research shows there's up to 4 million adults that are potential cannabis users in Michigan. Now, there's only 6.9 million adults, period, <laughs> in, in Michigan. Michigan. Right. So four million out of six point nine million. You knew, you knew when they when they estimated a million and a half that it must be an undercount at some point. Of course, absolutely true. We knew okay. it was too. So when we look at a market that's not only that large but that prevalent, as Ryan said, you can't pull shit on our people. You you can't hide it. We communicate with each other. We talk. When when you when Green Peak went after when Green Peak went after caregivers. Yeah, remember that. Lansing and, and banners and signs and 60 of their employees with identical matching okay. t-shirts, you know, and never the basically the only people that showed up for the and, rally. And no great sign that they learned, uh, you know, a lesson from that total debacle and misfire. When I, There's I plenty of, of anti-Green Peak signs there, too, with Radway's face on it. It was pretty yeah. funny. <laughs> <laughs> There's some pretty rude ones, too. But, uh, you know, what? Uh, as I look at Green Peak uh, leadership and I see how they post on social media and I see the arguments they make uh, when they, they discuss things on Facebook, they didn't learn a lesson. They're still so they are an example of what we were just talking about, the big resourceful places trying to use their influence to gain artificial market share as opposed to just going out and earning it, but, as Ryan suggests. But this is this. I, I, I agree with you. I'm not disagreeing. I just think that one of the problems we have is that the masses now are not us. We are not the masses. We are not the common weeds. We smoker. set the pace in this world, though, man. No, 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 no. I understand that. But the average guy who didn't smoke weed until it was legal or was a, or only had smoked sparingly because it was illegal, who now can legally go by at a dispensary. He's going to his local dispensary. 
He's not, he doesn't care. He doesn't know any better. And these people who have these mass outfits that don't really care about quality or don't really care about how they treat people, they're going to get, they're going to get the Budweiser customer over and over and over and over. You know, that would, that'd be true, Adam, except for they're not being who they are. They want to be the uh, Bell's Too Hard at, at Green Peak and Skyman and Lansing. You open up an Apple store in the hood, they're, they're selling their own flower, 50 to $70 eights. There's other stores that have been in the game. They're, they've got specials on their own eights that are better at $25 an eighth rec right now in Lansing. Yeah, it's And they're getting those cheaper customers. I agree. They're going to have to adjust, but I think – Part of it is when you promise you value yourself and you let loan and, and you borrow so much money, you make so many promises and mistakes. I, I'm not smart enough to know, but like my gut and watching, like, like what, you know, like just stuff doesn't make sense. Um, Look, if, so. you, if your profit potential was based on a, a $3,500 a pound cycle, right. and <laughs> now it's it's bouncing at $2,500 a pound. Or you're just dropping, to let it stay up at you know, 40 voodoo a gram. You're dropping your voodoo right now. So you are you are really in trouble because you don't know how you're going to be able to solve things because your profit margin is all whacked out. You were top heavy, built out a lot of facilities, spent a lot of money, borrowed a lot of cash to do that. Yep. Your top now, 20 people are not growers or people in the business. They're lawyers and whoever throw throw on top of that ryan a couple of crops maybe that don't pass muster that that have to be uh, discounted because they don't they don't satisfy testing isn't that been a, a case with some of the larger places ryan you would know better than us a lot of that a lot of willowing a lot of remediation yeah. um a lot of, of turning it into distillate but the distillate market with uh that crash seems like overnight too as far as i don't know about wholesale but the pens now the vape carts what they're go they're back to yeah. What they were going and uh, when the when we hit, were letting the caregivers still sell on as far as wholesale. Remember, we're still coming off the vape crisis, so there were some manufacturers that got out of the industry once that happened because it just kind of crashed. The demand, everybody was all suspect of it. So when it ramped back up, I think there was an artificial time where where there was a, a, a need in the marketplace because there were fewer people putting them out. Then all well, that and they cut off the caregiver supply for for distillate, and then when the rec, you know when there's people bringing in from out of state and. They cut that off abruptly on the rec side, you know, that shook it up. And then, you know, the, the October 1st date, all that came in and shook it up. And then there was nothing. And now there's, there was 50,000 outdoor plants that yeah. just got harvested. That's mostly almost all going to distillate. So that, and those are people now that are, have deals <laughs> with the vape, uh, whether the vape cart company did it themselves or that. A lot of those vape cart companies didn't have their own supply ever. They were just getting cheap Relabel. distillate and exclusive. Whoever choice was just making it for them. But now, so like, now, like some of those people got it and then they have it and they can't sit on it because sales aren't what they are with the market, you know, with going on what it is. So then they're just flooding it, dropping their pants and, and bringing their price way down. So there's a lot says of that at any given time, there's about 450,000 <laughs> plants in the, in the metric system at any yeah. given time growing under the regulated market. So, I mean, with that much supply, uh, you have to do better. You, you, yeah. The, the competition is so, great. He does realize there's more than that in the black market. Right? Oh, yeah. I think all of us realize <laughs> yeah. that. Probably by market. 10. So the, yeah, that's that's the number, okay. What was the number? 400? 450. 450. Yeah, I, I would guess by tenfold there's that yeah. in the black market. So We're estimating the black market at about eight eight billion in Michigan. What's your take, Adam? Yeah. It, triangulating hey, like the amount hey, so of nutrients so, sold hey, we're gonna, a square, like a, a you know, yeah. Like a, Hundred square miles and doing the math, like that's kind of where we came up with. I could hey, see uh, that. We're gonna we're gonna bring on our, our next guest and talk and just switch gears a little bit. But I want to say that um, Amanda Jocelyn uh, was watching or is watching and mentioned that she really likes your packaging now, um, Ryan. Oh, so somebody, a woman, is on chat saying she likes your package. So <laughs> take that in. Wow. And then uh, and hey, then she also check put the together. Time and date. She's she a black also, belt. Watch what you say about her. She also put together a um, a really good show for planting green trees yeah. last week with uh, uh, with Andrew D'Angelo, Steve D'Angelo's brother, and he was he was a big force behind the uh, Last Prisoner Project. He talked a lot about Michael Thompson and stuff too. Yep. So that was that was that's awesome. Yeah, she's doing a good job with her videos. Yeah. So let's bring in. Uh, uh, she did a great one for a botanical company in East Dallas, by the way, and it's going to come back up to Lansing. But we got Josie Scoggin from Sons and Daughters, and uh, yeah. you know, had her on. I've been able to talk to her for a long time. So 
really excited about that. And our company did a, a, a donation with her to help out a family um, in need in Lansing. And we did some shopping last night, so we'll talk about that for a minute. But let's see if we can bring on from Sons and Daughters United. Just get back to me. Ms. Josie Scoggin. Are you with us, Josie? I am like half with you. Like, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> okay. Cannot see Sorry. you, but can hear you. That's the half That's, you're talking about. It is right. like 2020. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Top Yay! half and bottom half. I'm so hey. excited. Look, look who I have. Oh, oh wow. she, is, uh, she does everything she's not supposed to. Yeah, my kind of kid. <laughs> of course. So she learns really from the best. To be here. Thank you guys for inviting me on. So I'm uh, I'm excited to announce your great work continues with Sons and Daughters United, and uh, yeah, and Sons and Daughters to... United was really a passion project that we started when. Um, in 2014, when our parents couldn't get unsmokable forms of marijuana. And my mom at the time, who had a uh, debilitating disease and he was given a time stamp of 18, uh, was no longer allowed to take the medicine that she believed in her life. Um, but when we started doing this, we found that there are a lot of policies that affect us, that affect children and adults and, and our families um, and the community that are unjust and that aren't doing what they're supposed to do. And so what we're doing now is we're looking to see what laws, how the laws adversely affect our communities and the children in it. Um, and so Jamie. Uh, saying a bunch of really awesome things about me right now. Um, Everybody knows. Uh, <laughs> but not at the right time. <laughs> he, he did him and the Botanical Company did sponsor one of our families. So every year we do a holiday holiday drive. This is our fifth year. Um, we only take on people who are experiencing unusual situations um, that aren't really that are overlooked by other policy or other organizations. Things like um, deportation, incarceration, um, emerging from domestic situations, and things that um, are traumatizing not only for the children but for the adults involved as well. Um, and so we don't limit our, this isn't the Salvation Army, I'm not giving people free gifts and we're done. Um, we're really looking at true and honest family structures that have been destroyed, usually by the drug war. And even if I'm seeing people who are coming in um, and they have somebody who's been incarcerated for 10 plus years for a non-violent drug offense, they still haven't been able to recuperate from that. They're not, their child, children aren't seeing their parents. Um, their Christmases have not been the same. And so we're always looking for ways, how can we make this magical? Um, and we really go all out. We'll do everything from buying, yes, here is. We'll do everything from buying the hottest games and gifts, but also we're buying winter gear, we're buying full wardrobes. And specifically this year, we had to get everybody things for remote learning. People need laptops, they need headphones, they need hotspot connections. Um, and when you're calling in nothing and spending everything you can just to stay connected to your loved one, um, there really isn't a lot of resources. And it's so, possible that your daughter's calling you. I'm not positive, but uh, I actually can't hear it. I have this mom thing where I just can't hear when they're <laughs> calling. Um, it's I've evolved to that point in my motherhood, but yes, dearest, yes. She just wants to be acknowledged. She has got me <laughs> in that sense. Hey, mommy. Yeah, I love you too. So, um, <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> so Jamie stepped up and he adopted one of our families. And this, um, this woman had throat cancer. She's been really struggling for the past several years. Her daughter is 13. And if anyone has a 13 year old, you already know, um, they're hard to buy for. And also the trauma that they're living of, of constantly the unknown of how her mom's doing and how she's, if she's going to be here next Christmas. Um, so Jamie really stepped up and went above and beyond and got the best Christmas gifts for this girl. Um, and this is something we've done in the past. We've had our friends at Lake Effect last year sponsor $2,500 for a family of six that was living in their car and just moved um, a couple of weeks before Thanksgiving. So they had nothing. 
and they bought beds, they bought dressers, they really knocked it out of the park. And so when, is awesome. when people are asking, you know, why, why aren't we getting grants for this? Or who do you, who do you collect or solicit donations from? Um, and I'm always going back to my friends at the cannabis community. And there's something that we have that other places like my friends in the restaurant community or um, my friends in retail don't have. And that's this undying passion that's been built into, um, into our movement, into our industry. And I think that I see that even in corporate cannabis, which is crazy to me, um, that everybody is pretty much on board. I mean, I know it's 2020 and we've been legal for two years now and um, holla, you know, but I still cannot believe how easily, um, how easy we can get help from our friends in the industry. So we need to mention your mother, Brenda, and Becky yeah. Walters, and Missy Jekyll, who works with us here at the Botanical Company, who uh, I stole went out. Missy from the um, ALS Association. Fun fact, she was working uh, for the ALS Association at the time. She definitely cares about people. There's no question. I can see her really trying to help people out in any in any manner. And we went out shopping last night and spent right around a thousand dollars to getting a bunch of stuff for this family. And it was really it was a, it was a cool experience. Uh, nice and we job, told, uh, everybody. Yeah, nice. we told everybody what we were doing, and of course they got excited for us. And we're happy and supportive, and just a good feel all the way around. We're really happy that these people who normally would not have these things are going to have these things this year. Well, the think, organization does that, man. I, I really appreciate that, Josie. And, and last year you did it too. We we did a family in East in East Tawas in a similar yes, uh, way. Got and, some, um, uh, we did do a family in East Tawas last year, and this, that specific family had been homeless um, for five months, and again re revolving. And what we're experiencing is is that man, Christmas is hard, but it is also super hard to start from the beginning. Um, and we got a letter this year from one of the families that we helped last year. Um, and they had gotten a new game system, which does seem pretty frivolous. I do understand that. Um, but they still have it. They'll probably have it for years. Um, and the letter was a thank you letter saying that they're now back on their feet, um, that they have never had a Christmas like the Christmas that they had last year, and that this year will be the first year that they can provide that kind of Christmas for their own children. Um, and so I always like to think of Sons and Daughters United as a second chance organization. We are really the last step before recovery. We also have a uh, scholarship program for people that have um, that have been affected by the aid elimination policy, which I'm sure a lot of you have been familiar with, um, which just says if you've been caught with misdemeanor drug crime, even if it's just pot, you lose financial aid, you lose your ability to take out great loans from the government at 6%. Um, you lose access to second to a secondary education. And we will provide $5,000 a semester to really help you with that, which to most state schools is significant. Um, and really, if you're in the middle of your if you're in the middle of your term, you're going to have to pay all that back. Um, and we do that. So I think that I love our sunset. So I do think that we are unusually lucky to be in the position that we are, which is um, being in Michigan in 2020 on the very forefront of criminal justice reform. I mean, we just passed the Clean State Bill. Clean Slate Bill. Thanks, Gretchen. You know, I know who I voted for. Um, and we have yeah. legal that is weed that is legal for us to purchase anywhere we want or grow. I mean, all my friends had phenomenal, phenomenal har harvest this year. Um, is this your reflection on the best things of 2020 right now? Because I was going to ask you that specific I question. I actually don't know if you guys right into it. 2020 is my year. And I have had the best year. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm all about well, it. Let's you know, hear I've about it a little bit. Bring, well, I've been begging people to do curbside for me. I, I don't know if you know this or not, but I have been crippled for about 26 years. And I have been just begging people to bring stuff to my car. And now they do it for fun, for no reason. Like, I don't have to be crippled or anything. <laughs> 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 All right. People take their health. Great equalizer. <laughs> washing their hands. I've I've never seen such. I've never felt better about um, being in around my peers and things like that. But I also feel that we're all experiencing this burden of um, of isolation that was brought in by COVID. And at Sons and Daughters United, we do a lot of prison work, so we have people who are incarcerated and they um they provide 
stamps and travel expenses and resources for them to take care of their loved ones. And most of these people haven't seen their loved ones in almost a year because of COVID restrictions. And more so, most of these people aren't able to contact them. Their loved ones are on quarantine and they don't have any information on it. Every one of our, uh, our uh, US prisons has a outbreak um, for COVID-19. And so what we're looking at as an organization that primarily deals with um, second chances and criminal justice reform is we're at an intersection with public health and how can we help these people who are literally trapped um, in these areas with the virus. And I don't, I don't really have a solution for it. We are definitely um, experiencing more requests than ever before. And we are denying people for the first time um, since we started in 2013, straight up for not having any money. We haven't been able to do any events. Obviously, um, people aren't really forking over their paychecks these days to buy fuck cancer shirts, uh, which are available if y'all are still interested in that. I'll take one. My, my hoodie, which I got as a gift, was stolen at Walmart. I took it off for a second to try on something else. I had to go try. back on. The shit was gone. I told somebody, and they're like, what does it look like? I said, well, it had a pot leaf on it. It said, fuck cancer. <laughs> and she says, well, that's probably why somebody stole it. Well, yeah. <laughs> it's more popular than any of the shit they've got in that store. That's why. It is definitely an icebreaker. That is no joke. Um, and we started the fuck cancer campaign for our good friend, Alyssa Irwin, who um, battled and won brain cancer multiple times. And her second route, she uh, her family was pretty... Um, pretty much in debt over the first, uh, the first ring with chemo, and um, we needed to raise several thousand dollars for her pretty quickly. So we released the fuck cancer shirts, and they sold out within two weeks. Um, hundred percent of the money went right to Alyssa Irwin. We brought her to Hash Bash. She did awesome. She did a phenomenal speech, um, and she had fun. I mean, for a kid that's sixteen and has cancer, um, it's not many things are fun. She um, is significantly older than 16 now, right? Yes, yes, absolutely. So, but, but, but I want to go back to a question to when she was 16, though. Or not a question, but a, just to remind people. She was going to school. She was taking driver's ed. She was functioning after a while. And she was on about three grams of chips and oil a day. Ed thing, but yeah. well, so what? It's, <laughs> it's far enough removed. She was, on, she was functioning fine. But she had she had a, a heroic dose of cannabis every yeah. single day as a 16 year old girl and she handled it like a champion and yeah. it, it significantly contributed to her well-being there's no doubt no yeah Bush avery found her um found her family in like a hardware store or something and was you know did that thing that he does he's carrying around his, little... <laughs> his igloo his, he probably still has the exact same one yeah and he <laughs> did the red igloo I mean, cooler <laughs> um the irwins will tell you 100 percent, no doubt she wouldn't have made it through the first round or the second round um, without cannabis and without Gersh um, in the Cannabis Cancer Project. And I think that um, that is something in Michigan's cannabis history, um, you know, black market cannabis history. But John Barber's monkey paw, it, those guys, I know. I got a call from somebody about a week ago, a week ago today, as a matter of fact, asking me for contact information for Gersh to seek some help, some information, and some help with some things for, for a patient. And in this world, in the midst of everything, and this person had talked to enough people and was recommended to them and said, if you have a hard time getting a hold of them, you could probably ask Jamie or some others, and they can help you out with that. Just testimony to Gersh is, is the point here. I mean, in the midst of all this new stuff, people are still, you know, kind of seeking out those who have proven themselves over the years for information. Yep. He's got yeah. it. And you I just, think that that's... Just... Go ahead. I just think we're in a really special part, um, part, right? I know we lost Long Monkey Paw over a year ago now, and um, I, one of my first hash bashes, I think I was 15, 14, it was my first year of my medical card, so I was 14, um, and he came up to me with a Frisbee, and he, like, offered to sign it, this old man with a giant beard wanted to sign the Frisbee as Monkey Paw, and I was like, sure, man, whatever you want to do, um, and then that same man also provided my mom with an outrageous amount of cannabis um, when she had her, her back surgery two years He also later. brought in uh, Red Dog when he needed a place to live for a while, yep. allowed him to move into his house. Yeah. You know, I have not heard a lot about um, Michael McShane since his death, and I just, 
also endlessly thankful for his trailblazing and the things that he's done for us. Mm -hmm. Um, And really, I don't, I have a good friend who has HIV. um, And I think that when we were, we did a series of HIV talks with uh, places like MAC, Michigan AIDS Coalitions, and um, at the University of Michigan. And we've been consistently talking about how cannabis helps with HIV um, in the way that it works with macrophages and the way that it, it can prevent it from turning into full AIDS. And I think that being able to talk about the science is one thing, but really seeing Michael McShane and the way that he lived and the way that he thrived for so long um, while being sick. And something else cool that uh, Rick will tell you is that Michael McShane knows cars like nobody else in the world. He knows everything about cars. He knows the makes, the models, the engines. He knows everything. Um, and so sometimes when I see a nice car, that is, I'll think of him instantly. Um, he was a, a sales of- rep for like auto paint or something. Paint, uh, yeah. Industrial paint for a while. Oh, yeah. yeah. This house on Troy and Ferndale. And we tried to do a little bit of a memoriam tribute show here shortly after his passing. Uh, a really lot good. of people, unfortunately, this this last year and in this whole movement, you know, we've unfortunately yep. had to say goodbye to for uh, it's, you know, oftentimes way too early. Josie, if people want to contribute to your fund, how can they possibly do that? I know there's a lot of people listening that will be interested in it. Yeah, so Sons of Daughters United is always accepting donations of all types. Um, would like to say that. So on um, sonsanddaughtersunited.org slash donate will be the easiest way for you to donate um, online. We also accept Facebook um, donations. If you find us on Facebook under Sons and Daughters United, um, you may... Find one of our locations in Niles, Lansing, or Flint to donate cash directly. Um, I am, God, what is it? The 22nd is three days till Christmas? I am always willing to take PayPal payments. Um, Again, the easiest way to reach us is sonsanddaughtersunited.org. All one word. You'll find actually a great photo on the front page of Jamie wearing a Dildos for Justice shirt. a nice big dildo on it so just for you like you know old time's sake dildos were brought up earlier in the show uh oddly enough what's a year so odd about that (laughs) i I think it's i think it's curious that jamie knows exactly what a 13 year old girl would like for christmas i I find i'll tell you i'll tell you I tell you what happened. That was the basis of some potentially creepy conversations during the shopping spree but missy jekyll was there with me who is not creepy when thinking about what a 14 year old girl <laughs> might like and we did end up it's buying mainly nice. even that's creepy we we did end up buying mainly gift cards so we went to victoria's <laughs> secret and i said all right let me pick out everything for this you know 14 year old girl i'm sure it'll, it'll all work out. <laughs> i thought hey you know gift gift a gift card that'd probably be a little bit better she can have her own we don't do that at sons of dogs actually <laughs> <laughs> and then uh uh we did buy some some items that were obvious on the list that would be good so they could open some stuff, but mainly it was gift cards. So her and her mother could go out and have have an experience together picking them, themselves out what they want from those places. So hopefully I mean, that'll be be a great experience for them. It's really humbling to see what these people put on their list. They want things like tennis shoes. They want a good bra. Um, some basic they, needs are they want for gifts. Yeah, so they want things that to, people actually get yeah. on a Tuesday. Um, and I think that that's really something that when we're doing the process and we get a bunch of these applications and we're looking at 30, 40, 50 applications from around the state and they all have equally terrible um, situations that they're going through, what's really humbling or maybe not humbling, but what's what's really startling is that there's so many people that are in need in our own community. Um, and I've recently moved to rural Michigan and I'm finding that the need here is not only skyrocketed so high and exponential, but there's nowhere to go. Um, here where I'm living in Buchanan represent we were voted the nicest city in America um and it's not because we got five dispensaries although we do in our in our small town um we I have to go to South Bend to get most of my stuff in Indiana you know I do have this basic theory which is if I die before I wake at least I wasn't in Indiana um but that's (laughs) really not a thing I can do anymore right everything I need is in Indiana all my services um, so we did open a bread pantry here this, uh, this spring in May, where we don't, we deliver 3,000 units of bakery items, um, here in Southwest Michigan and in South Bend, Indiana, um, to people in need every Tuesday, every week. And 
it is phenomenal. I mean, when we first started, we were struggling to get rid of the items. I mean, 3,000 items of bread and uh, buns and baker um, donuts and stuff is extremely difficult to get rid of um, when you don't have a plan. And so we thought that, you know, we would take half a truck and it would be easier. But now we are doing a delivery only on Tuesdays. We have nothing left. These people are counting on us for these items. Um, and I don't, I do believe a lot of it is COVID related, but I also believe that the services here in rural Michigan and more likely in rural America are, are lacking and they're not there. You've been able to keep this up through the COVID scenario though, too, because I know that, you know, Rick was, has been involved for a long time with some people um, getting, getting food to people every week. And then many of those people became reliant upon that, but the COVID scenario had to, had to really compromise that whole thing. Every Sunday on yeah. the east side of Flint. Yes. So, and, and we were well, asked to shut down by the city. Yeah. Was amazing. I mean, okay. they were doing more than just passing out bread that they got from Aunt Millie's on a nonprofit thing. They were cooking meals for these people and ensuring that they had not only a place to eat, but a community <laughs> to, think, to talk to. And okay. I think that that I've always been endlessly impressed by the work that they were doing in Flint. Mm -hmm. Um, and so when we got the opportunity here, one of my friends work at Aunt Millie's um, and they do a nonprofit program where they give these bread items uh, weekly to nonprofit organizations. And so he wanted to do the deliveries and we hooked that up. Um, we've got Pete's Marathon Station here in town giving us the U-Haul truck to do it. Um, and we've been doing that very consistently since May 6th. So we have, um, odd. Throughout the bulk of several it. months yeah. under it. Um, yeah. and it's become a thing that is, obviously it's enjoyable for, for us to give back and to be involved in our community in that level. Um, but it is also extremely, uh, it's, it's necessary. It's a necessary, um, commodity here in our community where we, people are, need us in order to, um, uh, to put food on the table. And you are awesome, Josie. You Thank are, you guys are. so much for having me on here. Hey, so I talked the whole time. And Brenda too, yay. And Becky and Missy and everybody who's worked with you. And, and, and Cadence. Uh, and Cadence. Yep. Yeah, family. Family. Yeah, Cadence. I remember seeing you back in the day uh, speaking at... Uh, in front of like legislators and it's so great to see what you the mean. very first uh minor patient to receive a medical card in michigan hey. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> that was awesome. you know when and i got my medical card um my doctor said do you want to get medical marijuana and i had thought that maybe he had drug tested me somehow because i was 14 and you know not smoking weed illegally but and he said that, you know, I don't want, I was taking fentanyl pops at the time. I had literal suckers that were had fentanyl infused in them. And I would just like, they would give them to me to take an MRI. I mean, they were just drugging me up at 14. Um, and so in April, we called every single day. And then finally in April, we were able to apply. And I, I got there April 1st. Um, and we, I don't think I got my card until like what? Six or eight months uh, later. March right? of the next year or something crazy. Yeah. Um, and then nobody except thought it was real because it was red and it said minor and there was no picture on it. Um, and people also you, didn't really know what to do with it. Um, do you still have that card? Oh, yeah, absolutely. My oh. mom has forced me to keep all of the cards. So oh. if you're ever interested in looking at a bunch of ridiculous stuff, I'll, I'll, I pay, I'll pay to, Josie, I'll pay to frame your cards if you want to get them mounted. Is Adam frame, Brooke right? on here uh, right now? Is that yeah, Adam yeah, yeah, Brooke yeah. talking I'll, to me? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll pay to frame those cards in something nice. All your minor cards. Okay. And we, just, we, just, we just witnessed somebody getting excited about Adam addressing them. That is I cool. Know. Another 2020 event. Not just somebody, I might add. A woman. A woman. A woman, a woman right. <laughs> Excellent line, Danny. Hey, so um, uh, Missy Jekyll just forwarded me a note um, from the mother of the family that was that uh, Sons and Daughters United helped out this year and I would like to read it. Please. No matter my situation, damn, I'm literally looking at my tree crying for 45 minutes now. I don't even deserve to be alive, let alone to be blessed enough to know such beautiful, kind human beings. God, you restored my faith in life. And God with this one had no clue how I was doing <laughs> Christmas this year and you all went above and beyond. Oh. That's great. And it, there's no shortage of people who, um, who need help. And that's really something that I'm struggling with is, is the ability to not help 
everybody <laughs> the ability to not do everything. Um, and so when we get these letters every year and we find people that are strongly deserving, and Jamie had asked me um, if his family, his, uh, his company was donating $1,000 regardless, and he wanted to know um, if it all should go to this family or if he, I wanted some of it for sons and daughters. Um, and it's, it's truly a pleasure to have the opportunity to give a variety of, give to a variety of causes worth, you know, giving to. Um, and so I, I had insisted that Jamie did what he felt was right as it's definitely a family worth investing in. Um, and so I'm so happy that she was able to deliver those things already and get them there. I mean, it's the 22nd, so I don't know why I said already, but I'm excited. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to be fantastic. And it's going to get better. She's going to open this stuff. It, the gift cards are never ending. I mean, last year I got messages in July, like, hey, I just took my kid to Sephora to get her makeup done, and she's excited. She's never been this happy, da, 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 whatever. And it seems frivolous, but if you've never <coughs> been able to do these things, if the only things that you're getting um, is a trip to the food pantry and, you know, a couple of your, the tennis shoes that you're going to wear to school, I mean, these are things that I think kids deserve. I think that they deserve, even if they are materialistic. Well, it's tough when, when you when you see all these images on television of people enjoying these things, and you know that your situation never ever allowed you the opportunity to do that. You grew up. I mean, I grew up in Flint. I I raised three kids in Warren. So I, I mean, to, to look at to look at scenes of, of Florida vacations that you know you'll never be able to take, and Hawaii vacations that you know you'll never be able to take, and and one hundred and fifty dollar tennis shoes that you know your kid's never going to be able to to get, no matter how badly he wants them. You know, it's yeah. a tough thing to grow up. So to give someone a little bit of that, that, that stuff that they thought they could never have, that's magic. It's more it than is. I mean, a gift of normalcy is something that we are taking for, um, we take for granted, you know, just, just normal things. It's, <laughs> this is our fifth year in doing this. And normally when we first started it, we were doing it with the green, uh, the thin green line which is Jamie, Jamie Fricky had started this program for people who were arrested with mar for marijuana charges. And they would provide your kids with clothes, toys. I mean, this is any day of the week um, because they freeze your bank accounts. You don't have any money. You can't do anything, you know? Um, and Jamie has done a lot of, Jamie Fricky did a lot of really great work with that. And so I was really happy to work with her. Um, She's a pioneer of sorts that doesn't get enough mentions uh, at times. That's true. She's done a lot of stuff over the years. Specifically, the Thin Green Line had done a lot of work for, for people that we um, that we know, that we have worked well with. Um, the Duval family, most notably, at the heart of all my conversations about people who have been endlessly screwed over by the, go the government and the drug war as a whole, is the Duval family. Um, and Jerry, you know, it's still jars. It's terrible. And uh, in full Super. disclosure, when I got out of prison... Uh, I received a holiday package from the Thin Green Line um, that had all kinds of gifts and toys for my kids and stuff like that. I mean, I got out in October, so uh, mid-November I was contacted, and uh, and I and, and, and my issue is I didn't need anything. Um, I was not in need. This was this was a gift because they knew that I had just gotten out of prison. So oh, yeah. I, I've always really appreciated that. Um, and uh, as a kid who grew up on scholarships and looking at $30 gym shoes, thinking that they were uh, the shit, uh, you know, I, I know what people uh, feel like when they receive this stuff. So it, it, it means a lot to me that the weed people are involved. Um, and uh, I, I do think that, that this is uh, a new thing for us, too, because I can remember back in the day trying to give money and not people not taking it because it was coming from the weed people. But now yeah, that we seem to have been normalized, it seems like we should be stepping up and doing this. So. But Josie, yeah. it looks like you've been sitting at your location for a minute. You might want to make a move. You're welcome to hang on. I, 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 uh, I don't want to inconvenience you. Oh, I'm doing a curbside thing. I told you I'm all about it. So oh, okay. I thought maybe you got back to your house. place. You're, you're, you're waiting to get a, 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 a deal. Okay. A delivery. Hey, I oh, wanted yeah, to get man. to... Uh, We've been joined in the Any meantime chance? by John Schlicker from uh, Northeast Michigan Normal, and I wanted to get his thoughts on a couple of things. Another fine human being who's done a lot of good things for other people over the years. And, and this last year, we did some stuff together that was pretty cool, and e even in the midst of the COVID stuff. And I uh, uh, wanted to get his thoughts. He's been waiting for a little bit. Are you even there listening to me, John, or just your presence? There he is. 
There he is. And he happens. Hey, to hey, everybody, can you hear me? Yeah, we caught him. We caught him smoking some cannabis in a rare situation there. I imagine that. <laughs> so, so um, you know, obviously, what what do you have in your um, human kindness and uh, uh, things that you've done this year that could trump uh, everything that Josie just said? Why are you a better person than Josie Scoggin, John? Go. I am not a better person. I am not a better person <laughs> than anybody on this call. Oh, you're a better so person than I am. Than I, I am only a better person because I know most of you is on this call and because of uh, cannabis, uh, which has brought us all together. Yeah. Well, my point is uh, we have a long list of great stuff that, that, that Josie has, has done and continues to do. And I just wanted to highlight that a little bit. But uh, uh, John, you yourself have done a lot of great work. And this last year, we did the uh, highway cleanup. Northeast Michigan Normal sponsors all types of really good stuff, man. And uh, uh, Yeah, we do. I'm work. very proud of our group up there. Yeah. And what what's uh what's the big story for you? What's what's the uh, the big reflection in 2020 for John Schlicker? Well, fuck COVID, fuck Bill Shooty. Thank God we don't have to deal with him anymore. Uh, <laughs> we haven't had to for a little while, but it's always the good book. To, to the book is good thing. <laughs> I know COVID has affected everybody, even you know up here in. Uh, rural areas of northeast michigan and uh hence it's it's hindered us as far as being able to get out and and do a lot of promoting and do things but it has not stopped us yeah well one of the stories is the big events didn't take place adam couldn't do his his normal events uh the right. hash bash you know the, all that stuff didn't take place your canapalooza event which was great yeah. last year yeah. didn't take my, place none of my conferences went down this right. year i typically do three a year uh, i know there's just a lot of stuff that normally would have evolved that was denied yeah but we're we're meeting as a board of our chapter uh, at least once a month continuing to try to make some plans to um give back to the community as well as promoting the uh Reforming, we still need to do with cannabis. You know, we came a hell of a long ways, as we all know, but there's still a lot of work to do. And uh, I had to step away for a while, but I got to catch Ryan talking earlier. And uh, if you're still on, Ryan Baser, I love you, brother, and I admire what you do. Uh, He's still cannabis. listening. He, he, he did get off for a second. I wanted to have him bring on Tom and Krista Beller for their thoughts, too, if he was still on. But uh, uh, right on on that. He, he, did, he did leave, though. I'm just, uh, I'm very thankful that we've got it legal here now in Michigan to, uh, to the degree that we do at least. And uh, I know there's a lot of work to do. I'm gonna keep pushing forward and doing that. Uh, COVID did not affect the cannabis industry directly as a whole, I don't think. Uh, it didn't affect my, uh, my end of it here. Uh, as Adam said, I really, uh, <laughs> You know, our market, uh, or mine at least, uh, through my caregiver and, and then uh, yeah, the gray, unregulated uh, <laughs> market. You don't, you don't have to yeah, disclose I, too much, John. We all know what you're talking about. Yeah, I well, would, you know, it, COVID was kind of good there earlier on, you know, but things dried up a little bit. But, hey, it's, it's coming back. And uh, Hey, them $600 checks will be in the mail soon, John. Don't worry. Things are going to pick up in the streets. That's Amen, all. brother. Amen. I, I hear that, too. And, and I, I, I feel it. And uh, I can I can actually see the trickling. Uh, other people are feeling that, too. So, you know. But I would, I would tell you that the weed, the, the weed industry was severely impacted by COVID, but in a positive way. It it, it it caused for a lot of improvements that the legislature and the the uh, direct even the director uh, Brisbo would not have approved uh, um, and not have uh, agreed to had COVID not happened. That so, is true. Um, yeah. as Josie no, pointed and, out, and curbside that's going to stay. Curbside, curbside and, right? I mean, curbside, we got to keep it. I'm 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 not a guy to buy from a dispensary, and I would never do curbside. I'd want the guy to meet me on the corner and do it the old school way, you know, hand to hand. <laughs> but uh, just so it had a dirty feel to it. Yeah, I yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, I know yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I suggested to a buddy of mine that owned a dispensary that he should make that offer. You know that we offer curbside right, right. and corner deals also. Wear a trench coat, right? And, you know. 
So I, I think you know, I'm still listen. I still think that most places should sell, should sell the John Sinclair package, which is two joints. You know. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, but it, it, it's good to know that that guys up north, things are the same. You know, I mean, it, the great state of Michigan, um, uh, things have happened differently with COVID. North, south, uh, way up north. You know, we've all been impacted different ratios. But I still contend that on the streets, when it comes to the the black market, nothing's changed. Mr. Hashbash, let me just say this. Uh, the, the black market is based on personal relationships, not based on brick and mortar businesses. It's also not based on cartels like a lot of people would like to paint it. It's a lot of people who know a lot of people. This is the guy I hang out with. I watch football with every once in a while. This is my cousin's friend, and I started hanging out with him a couple years ago. That's what the that's what the so-called black yep. market why you can't defeat it because it's not a traditional right. market it's based on relationships and as jamie mentioned earlier in the show uh, sometimes the corporate entities forget that relationships or maybe it's based on forget that relationships are important and that it always has been so the corporate guys were the corporate guys boomed as soon as they were deemed essential that was a game changer for the cannabis industry okay. it is being deemed essential and being able to open and stay open meant that a lot of money was spent with them that probably wouldn't have been spent had they, you know, uh, I don't even know if, if COVID hadn't have been, hadn't it happened, would those places have done the business they did? I'm not sure of that. Well, we I'm know. Sure that, that, go ahead, go ahead, Jamie, you know more than I. Well, I was just going to say that I think that things would have gone fairly well, at least I guess from, from my perspective, uh, just coming from East Tallis, the actual physical place that I was involved in and saw happen. Um, but, uh, I would, but, but I do, uh, you know, I do think that there was something to be said. You can look at the set of circumstances and say, people got extra money. Some people got more money from the stimulus and, and taken unemployment than, than they, they would have made. They were earning before. Right. And but that's a, that's a thin slice of Michigan. Well, yeah. And well, I'm just going to explain what, you know, the thought is by some people. And then, you know, basically stayed home while cannabis companies were essential and you could drive up and have, you know, cannabis brought to the door. So time, money, ability, and uh, people put that together and say, we probably had some extra cannabis use. I tend to believe that the, the first year and the first stores establishing themselves um, properly, because as we discussed, some other places did not establish themselves properly, uh, would have seen some pretty good business. Whether it's the exact same, I don't, you know, I don't know for sure, but I think we, we, we would have been pretty good at, you know, either way. I mean, if you're talking about an industry that's already doing this on an upscale, uh, where the question is whether it was like this or whether it was like right. that, it, yeah. it was always going to be moving in a forward direction. But I mean, some of the things they did certainly helped out. Jim, go ahead. What you got? I was just going to say, like, I don't know about you guys, but my cannabis intake has increased dramatically over COVID. I never thought that it would. <laughs> But it, it, it <laughs> I love she Josie's laugh. I didn't know <laughs> she, didn't drop she, encourages, she encourages more intake. She hears that and just like that's exciting. Uh -huh. More didn't intake. Know that I heard that. <laughs> that's great. That's great. You can see it in the sales too. Like it's in marijuana in Michigan. It's like got skyrocketed, and now it's like kind of plateauing. Well, you say you see it, but what it you know. If they were available and just came on new this year and we didn't have COVID, does that mean less people would have necessarily bought cannabis? I mean, it's hard to say. I think well, it would have been but done well, for sure. They all had a stimulus check, though, too. Right. And, there, and that stimulus part, check argument is huge. That yeah. stimulus check argument is, huh. is, I've heard it in other industries where they claim that their people got money that they wouldn't have normally had. And it wasn't money that was necessarily needed, so they spent it on frivolous. Sure, more money, more time, and then cannab time. cannabis is essential. So those things seem to add up. But like, how much of that really was a part of it? It's kind of hard to say. Go ahead, Josie. I'm sorry. No, I just know how exactly how I spent my twelve hundred dollars, and it definitely helped the cannabis industry out a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think one of them probably not an uncommon story too. And it's all well, true. Just how much of that you know, made a difference in, in, in uh, the bigger picture. That's all. Jim, before you go to you, uh, I mean, we are facing a housing crisis right now. Evictions are huge because people haven't been able to pay their rent. I mean, we're looking at so many different ways in which the United States have been negatively impacted by COVID. We're joking, but uh, it, the reality is there's a lot of people here who really needed that money in order to pay for <coughs> safe essentials. Please, Jim, go ahead. Uh, yeah, hey, good point, Rick. Um, I, I just wanted to add to, uh, to that, that, you know, we've had such a long running medical law in Michigan that, I think that really helped us stay or become essential. 
um, having had that long uh, stretch of uh, medicinal loss before recreation kicked in last year, you know, so. Yeah. I think that's I, right. I, I think, um, I don't think any of us are surprised that medical marijuana was deemed essential. I think we're all like, yeah, it's essential, but for you to recreationally have to smoke marijuana is awesome. For the state to say recreational marijuana is an essential business is so Michigan. I'm so happy. Yeah, to be the, here. the state has an interest in that perspective too. <laughs> right. The, well, there's no tax collected for medical marijuana sales, but there are tax collected for recreation. Right. Right. So, you know, I want to. I want to point out our, our another thing that I, that I really like about my company. Um, just reminds me of this conversation. We do not charge the excise tax for those who are patients buying adult use products. So if you demonstrate, so if you that, only have it on the one side, you don't charge. The tax. We don't charge the patient for excise tax. That's right. Just like and you know, you, we don't charge. We charge. We give ten percent off for veterans. Ten percent off for seniors. 10% off for medical marijuana patients. Are you able to transfer product from side to side? You can, a, you, have to, you have to go through a seasoning period. Okay. And then up to half of what was seasoned for a month could then go over. That can happen in cultivation and retail. It's not as common anymore, but it still goes on. It still can be done. So well, the initial, the company the rocks. Initial, in the initial stages when they did that, it was because there just wasn't any adult use right. facilities on. So they had to migrate some cannabis from the medical side to the adult use or there'd have been no supply to satisfy the customers. So I, I would point out also, I was in a grow shop the other day and the amount of people that started growing when the lockdown started happen or whatever you want, quarantine started happen was phenomenal. I, I, we talked about how, you know, how many people did you came to you and wanted a, an initial startup? And we had a conversation about that. Then we talked about the guys who had a, a grow and who flipped it because they'd been waiting to do their turn to go from their HIDs to their LEDs or guys who went from the smaller warehouse to the big warehouse. So there's a lot of people that took advantage. And, and I think that some of the things we see in the latter half of 2020 may not, by time mid 2021 happens, we may be in a whole different place in Michigan, yeah. um, especially when it comes to the rules, because I'm really looking forward to see uh, how things change or what's allowed or not allowed. Or, you know, Brisbo has been running his mouth with Rick, as we know, and uh, God knows what's going to happen here. Well, I'll tell you what, I, I was just quoted in the Detroit Free Press today about a, a, a explosion that happened in Oakland County and what Sheriff Bouchard said and was quoted in the free press also was very telling where he said it's time for us to get these the production of cannabis out of the residential areas right. not that we stop butane but get the production of cannabis out of the residential areas and we've been listening for this for a long time because we know law enforcement really doesn't want you to have the ability to grow at your own <laughs> residence so we're always cautious about that and knowing that there's an effort to change the law coming in 2022 or 2021 rather, uh, and that that's the only time they'll be able to amend a voter directed initiative is when they have a big thing like that. It makes me even more cautious. So and, that, that, go ahead, Adam. I'll, I'll well, I just in. wanted to say on that same line, and I tell you this, Rick, because I know what path you're gonna be headed on on this. One of the things they do is they go to the chiefs, the fire chiefs association, and they get the association to make comment that they think that grows in homes are a fire hazard. I am, I beg every one of you, especially you, Rick, when you're in a community, contact the fire chief and ask him if he agrees with what his association says, because they do not. Fire, local fire chiefs do not see home grows as a fire hazard, because most people live in a home where their electricity is up to code, and they don't, and they have fire, uh, um, detectors and things. So it, they don't find it the problem that the association will claim because Bouchard is going to go get his, um, you know, Sheriff's Association. He's going to get his uh, Fire Chiefs Association. And they're all going to say that, oh, marijuana at home is a problem. Well, I'm sorry. I've read enough articles that argue that open blasting is a problem. Open blasting, by definition, is not a problem. Blasting indoors is a problem. Whether it's open or not is another issue. But the, the, the misnomers and the misinformation that's used against us 
is huge we, in that. We have to protect individual rights uh, and, and always look out for that. Correct. And this is all part of this conversation. And all of us here are on that are on that side and, and are activists in, in our own way. And we'll, we'll look out for that. And, and just if I should, viewers know, a blessing that he's mentioning is talking about a, a methodology of concentrating cannabis where you remove the vegetative material and just keep the... Uh, it's the, usually the, a butane is the issue and you're inside. It's a heavy gas, so it sinks. You can't like have just a, a window right. open or something like that for right. ventilation. No. And then right. it hits the pilot light of, of, a, of the hot water heater or somebody lights up a cigarette or a joint. And then you have but, the problems, you know. Right. But, that, but open, not that common, really. Most people are... Open, open blasting should never be done indoors. That's just common sense. And it's not. It's it's always a problem. And that's unfortunately and in that's cold weather people people compromise their safety standards when it's cold outside. Oh, uh, there's know. a great uh, tragedy. There's many of them, but there was a great tragedy in Oscoda uh, last year. Some people are about ready to get into business. And, oh, there, there's and every it, community it has major, major explosions. In, in Ypsilanti, there was an early one where the neighbor's yeah. camera caught it. You can see the roof popping off. the. Yeah, listen. But, though, but given the amount of times that that process has taken place under those situations, how many correct. times we've seen one of those, it's it's not that common. Less are, than turkey boilers. Remember those hey, people dropping their turkeys yeah. into the hot liquid, the oh, peanut yeah. oil, and blowing their peanut, shit up peanut, and burning Peanut oil, right. Happens yeah. all the time. All and, and the time. delicious and, when you and, do it right. And hey, that's so, why it's important yeah, to get the facts when you do. on this. You know, you guys, we have a lot of people on here right now, and we're getting too close to the time we're going to have to, you know, close it down and start a dissent. And uh, <laughs> I want I want to begin to just really appreciate everybody for participating in this conversation. I thought it was really cool. You know, we're talking about 2020, the good and the bad, and uh, some really good guests on today, Adam. It's always good when you come on. Usually, usually it's, it's like a co-host scenario, you know, when you, when you come uh, on with us most yeah, of the time. Yeah, it's an issue. Yeah, and... Uh, Obviously, Roach, you haven't been made it on for a little while, but I'm glad you came back for this one. This is a good one. And I uh, always enjoy being on Medical Mondays. Bert, been on the last couple of times. Good contribution today. Uh, I'm just wondering maybe when we throw it out, anybody has anything they need to say still or maybe add in uh, what you're looking forward uh, to for next year uh, while ready. Hey, Josie, anything you want to uh, leave us with? Yeah, you know, I think I've been jokingly saying consistently the worst thing about legalizing marijuana is everyone can grow their own. I have not grown, smoked so much shitty weed in my life. Um, but this year, the harvest was so good. It was like everybody was home and they were able to nurse their babies. Um, and I think a lot of my friends really saturated the market. So if you've got any extra funds, please feel free to hit us up on Facebook, Sons and Daughters United. Give us a donation. Thank you. Very nice. Hey, John, are you still hanging out with us in there? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, it's hard not to look at your beautiful face and have a meaningful conversation that we need here. If you can come oh, on yeah. and give us some last words, that would be cool. The top of your uh, head, anyway. Well, <laughs> I want to wish everybody happy holidays, Merry Christmas, and uh, 2021 is going to bring a lot of good things, I believe. I really do. I just got faith that it's going to be a lot better for everybody. And uh, shout out to uh, the botanical company, Jamie's, you got a great, uh, a great store there. Uh, they care about the people. Uh, so. Appreciate that, John. Yeah. Man, I love John so much. I do also have to say, like, I can love John. <laughs> I really do. Thank you, no, John, for legalizing too. marijuana. No, couldn't have done it without all, all of us here. So I thank you. I love you, too. Everybody here has been an inspiration to me, and uh, it's what keeps me going, and uh, I keep dodging the arrows that do keep coming at me up here in this conservative red area I live in. But you're you're a force, John. You hold down the fort in your own backyard, and then you go around the state and help everybody else out too. Very much appreciated. Well, thank you, Jamie, and uh, thanks for all the help over the years, both you and Rick. Uh, I love you. Well, thanks, John. We are planning. Our chapter is planning a uh, fundraiser, probably going to be held in March. Uh, so let's just keep our fingers crossed, say some prayers that we don't have some kind of limit, to, you know, 50 or less, you know. And it'll be right on the line of things beginning yeah. to open up a little yeah. bit. We'll have to so, see by then. Trying to stay positive and keep planning, uh, just like Canapalooza 2021, it will happen. So, I hope so, man. Yep. Hey, Roach, thanks, what, do you, what do you want to leave us with, man? And thanks for coming back on today, too. It's been a little while. Oh, and, and thanks for having me, man. Uh, really appreciate you guys. Uh, I don't know. I, I guess, you know, in what we were saying about, you know, all these harsh lines being drawn, 
and all the separation, you know, uh, I, I think we, we should also focus on the unity of that, on, on the fact that, you know, there's some people who were maybe on the fence before or maybe were a, a, of a different state, state of, uh, or school of thought. And after seeing what their allegiance was capable of, have, you know, come back to center and, you know, rational thinking. So, you know, that's happening too. Um, I'm really proud of like all these um, podcasts in Michigan, uh, all the cannabis podcasts, you know, like all the, all the ones that are like enduring all have like relationships with each other. And, you know, we're, we're just like a little community within the community, man. So I, I want to say thanks to everybody, you guys here, uh, the Michigan Bro Grow Show, Medical Mondays, of course, um, and Jazz Cabbage. You know, you, you guys are all awesome. 420 Post, Planet Green Trees, yep. Reeds yep, and Weeds. Yep. Rope uh, and smoke. Smoking yeah. rope. Smoking rope. Smoking rope. Smoking pole. <laughs> all awesome. really the cannabis it. community is awesome. Wow, it's a great family. <laughs> it is. Hey, Berg, what do you got, man? Uh, I mean, I make it I, profound and life changing. Go. Oh, I mean, come on, twenty twenty one. That's that's all I got. Follow us on Instagram. Uh, we're gonna be doing some giveaways for the show. Uh, Medical Mondays podcast on YouTube. Subscribe, get notifications, all that. And I mean, I'm looking forward to all the new people I'm gonna meet and have on the show, man. So. Very good. Right on, hey, Adam. Mr. Yeah. Hashbash. Twenty twenty one. Oh well, you know. The future, in my opinion, it, things can only get better. I'm looking forward to, of course, once this COVID thing passes us and we can all start getting back together in groups. Um, the one thing I like to tell people, as we all know about weed, is that it brings people together, no matter who you are, where you are in the world. Um, you'll find yourself near someone or next to someone who you wouldn't necessarily normally find yourself next to or near, someone you may not agree with, someone you may not even like or care for, someone that you may find offensive, but the fact that they have a joint in their hand and they're willing to pass it to you and they expect it back and that creates yeah. back and forth, there's no substance on the planet that does that. I mean, I've seen it. I've seen people that are known aiders smoke a joint. Yeah, it kind of crosses the spectrum, doesn't it? And, uh, yeah. We're, all can be in that in that column. And and that's the tell. one thing that and that's the one thing that we need is we need to be able to get together as a culture. That's what we do. So yeah, it's great getting together and doing these Zoom things where you know the virtual event you have a bunch of people, but we need to get back to being together. Um, and I'm hoping that that returns soon. Um, but I do have to ask, is Roach in the uh, Purple Rain Room or what the hell's going on there with the purple background, man? That's don't pretty hate. sweet. It's I'm not hating. I don't know, man. It's just purple as fuck around here. I'm I never noticed it before, your, man. <laughs> I'm wondering where your rainbow wig is, man. Hey, bro. Right that would here. look really cool against that background. I, I went into a restaurant today, and the guy behind the counter recognized me, and he said, did you shave? And I said, yeah, I did. Uh, and he said, no, no, man, you got rid of that colored hair? I'm like, dude, that, that's a fucking, are you serious? That's a dollar store slide on, yeah, yeah. It offers a nice little flair to your presentation there. There you Doesn't go. Doesn't it, though? My man thought it was real, too. I know. <laughs> the power I of television, Adam. Cat. The power of television. Hey, man. Hey, let me they believe you. it if they see it. This is hey. what 2021 is all about right here. There the colors, go. people. Perfect. Power to the people. Let's be colorful. Beautiful next year. Hey, Jim, what, do you, what would you like to leave us with? And what are you looking forward to? 
Oh, man. Well, you know, as of today, the days are now getting longer uh, because of the winter solstice. Uh, so that's good news. The days going to be longer, more light. I'm looking forward to the sacred plant psychedelic healing um, uh, in 2021 and getting that going more. Um, Looks I'm like about about the social justice issues and where we're going with social justice right now. And how people are, are uh, their eyes are open and, and they're, they're, they're looking at their perspectives and others. I think that's really important. And I'm also, I didn't mention this before, but just the fact that cannabis is essential is uh, just incredible. And uh, it, that really is, you know, everyone here and, and beyond and that's gone uh, is, is responsible for, for a lot of that. And uh, it's awesome. Yes, it totally is. Thanks, man. Colin, what do you got? Uh, well, I mean, I gotta echo what Jim was talking about, uh, and Adam. We need to like be back together. It is fun doing the Zoom thing, um, but uh, definitely next year is gonna be uh, you know challenging, and hopefully we'll uh, get through this virus and uh, push for more um, cannabis uh, reforms and ex uh, expunging people's records and. Um, psychedelic reforms in other cities across Michigan. Um, I was going to say, uh, Josie was the one who called me um, back I in like 2000. Is on here. Yeah. Um, she called me like. Nice you know, reunion for Josie tonight, by the way, for a lot of people. And I came to a fundraiser in like Royal Oak, uh, Michigan, and I like, I saw Jamie. I got your number there. And uh, I met a, b a bunch of people. Um, uh, in the cannabis world, so um, that's really cool. And uh, John Schlicker is always my hero too. Mm -hmm. um, well, come on now. And so uh, I was 19 when I met Colin, and he was working at Kroger um, for as a manager, and I did, I, he wanted nothing more than to legalize marijuana and be a part of the of the process. He wanted to. Um, it's really hard to find people to work for free. Um, it's even harder to find people to work for free for years, and Colin did that. And so every time I see Colin, he tells a story about how I'm the one that called him and got him into the cannabis industry. Um, but it is 100% just Colin's willpower <laughs> and his dedication to change. I mean, that's something that you're born with. You can't can't teach it. So, hell yeah, Team Colin. Right on. Yeah. <laughs> So, hey, Rick, why don't you take us out here last couple of minutes? Well, if, if we're looking forward to 2021, my big takeaway, my big hope is that we don't forget, okay? There's a lot of lessons that were learned in 2020 that we need to remember. One of them is, is who supported crazy, wild conspiracy theories in the face of factual evidence, who viciously attacked you on social media and refused to listen to logic, Remember those people because later on they're going to want to do business deals with you and you know what they're capable of. Later on they're going to want to, to try to over talk you in a conversation and you know who they're, they're getting their information from. Learn that. We also learned a lot about ourselves. Loneliness will tend to do that to you. You know, if you have nobody around and you have to face yourself, sometimes those demons become a little bit larger as you as you don't have a sounding board to get rid of them or, or a place you can go where you can alleviate your mental stress. Uh, we learned about ourselves and we shouldn't forget about that too. But we also learned about the nation. We learned that the nation can come together in times of great stress like, like a vote right? Like a, a situation where we have to make the most important decision of, of our electoral lives. And more people than ever turned out to do that. And then let's think about the world, all right? As a vaccine raged across countries, across country lines, uh, you know, blurring the definitions between nation and state, uh, people showed up, people helped each other. Globally, the community contributed towards seeking a vaccine. Now vaccines are being produced in one country, being shipped to other countries to help out. We've had promises that we'll provide particular amounts of vaccine to certain nations that don't have financial resources to get their people taken care of. Uh, those are lessons that we can learn. Now in 2021, if the problem goes away and we revert right back to the same kind of dog eat dog, uh, you know, grab them by the throat, kneel on the throat until they die, kind of a mentality. 
if that's what we do in 2021 when times go back to being good, then fuck us and fuck America. But I don't think we're going to do that. I don't think we are. I think we're going to remember the lessons <laughs> to move forward as a better nation. And, and I think by staying involved, we guarantee that. All of us are, are difference makers, and we have to celebrate that. So remain engaged, keep pushing forward, and never forget. That's my message. I agree, man. I really, I really hope that the, the movements that spawn out of this year and showed some promise and some momentum for change actually carry that into next year, and we see that, and it's real. Uh, and uh, I also want people to celebrate Michael Thompson today and, and look forward to more of that kind of activity uh, next year. Really appreciate everybody's involvement. Really cool discussions. Uh, I like what a lot of people had to say. Is too much of it to, to recount, but uh, we had a uh, perspective here that I think is really good for everybody. There's Yeah, there's a lot of shit that has taken place, but we can pull out some, some really good stuff and we can build on that for next year. Uh, a lot of us are motivated to do that. So thanks, everybody, and have a good week. Uh, not sure what's going to go down next week, but uh, it'll be around the holidays and all that kind of shit. So maybe we'll do we'll make something. game time decisions. We'll do something. <laughs> but uh, but tonight was good, and I really appreciate it. Thanks, everybody, for joining us, and uh, have a good rest of the night, and let's Peace. celebrate a little bit. See ya. Appreciate it. Ask Cabbage Cafe. Thank you.